So hello and welcome to the first webinar in the Elemental Talks program for 2022. Happy New Year. It's not too late to say that. I don't think our topic today, driving improvements in consumer energy and water efficiency. The question we're asking and hopefully answering is how can the industry support domestic consumers in going green and saving money? In our session sponsored a part of a series by Triton. I'm your chair for the next 60 minutes, Jim McClelland founder and editor of Sust Meme, home to both the magazine and the top 500 rankings. Joining me on the panel this afternoon are Vittorio Benino, head of Anglian Centre for Water Studies, Anglian Water Services, Steve Johnston, home water efficiency slash water saving manager at Affinity Water, Emir Poole, manager, Centre of Technical Excellence, Homes England, and Neil Wilson, senior marketing manager at Triton. It is all live, there's a Q&A to finish, so pop your questions in the appropriately named Ask a Question box. You should see at the bottom of your screen. If you type them in there, you pose them, I'll ask them, they'll answer them. So a little bit about Elemental. This webinar forms part of a program of talks hosted and produced by Elemental, elementalexpo.com. It's the online community for professionals focused on innovation in heat, water, air, and energy, as the name implies, the vital elements within the built environment now and in the future, you'll find a full diary of events on the website. There's a range of upcoming webinars this month, next month, and onwards. You can also view the back catalog, whole host of topics, all available on demand, who's who of great speakers, and I should add, everything is free to access. Plus this year, the physical real world in-person Elemental Expo will take place at the NEC Birmingham, 21 to 23 June, 2022. So see you there, right. Got a lot to cover today many insights to follow, so I'll be very brief in my intro. Water and energy efficiency. The fact that an average family could save 46,720 bottles of water annually simply by installing a flow regulator into a standard mixer valve is significant for water sustainability. Not, however, necessarily common or public knowledge. So this second webinar in the Elemental Water Sustainability series produced in association with Triton, explore how the industry can influence consumers to conserve water and energy resources in an impactful way, one that becomes positively habit forming for the long term. In short, how can we affect behavior change around water sustainability? Discussion of weight relative merits of on one hand aspiration and efficiency as forces for change amongst consumers plus review their power as drivers of market growth and shift too. So typically, we understand homeowners and residents, they're motivated to measure their water and associated energy consumption for one or both of these following two reasons. One, they want to save valuable resources because of a shared aspiration to embrace a more eco lifestyle inspired to do their bit for society and the planet. And or they're driven to save water and energy in a bid to manage and minimize those household bills through efficiency gains and household budgets are very much under pressure, as we all know. So whether shrinking their water and carbon footprint to go green or cutting costs to help with the home budget, the webinar examine exactly how the industry can support those consumers in getting the information they need to make better choices. Right, enough from me, let the debate begin. So as we start to explore the relationship between water efficiency and energy saving in the home, the motivating forces behind behavior change, plus some of the obstacles to progress. I'd like to begin by asking our panelists to introduce themselves, explain their perspective, <coughs> share some opening insights. So briefly, it's a, who are you? Where do you fit into the puzzle? Where do you think the market is right now when it comes to supporting those consumers in going green and saving money through water efficiency? So first up, a perspective from the UK's largest community focused water company. Steve, your opening thoughts, please. Yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Steve Johnson, Water Efficiency Manager and Water Saving Manager for Affinity Water. So I currently work within the demand management um, team at Affinity Water. Um, it's a kind of a, a core function of the business where we look at demand management activities. Um, it's currently made up of five core pillars, each that have their own lead. Uh, these are made up of uh, focusing on demand, driving meter penetration up, building advocacy, um, building sustainable consumer behavioural change and influencing regulation, policy and supply chain decision making. So I look after uh, pillar one, which is mainly our operational activity. Um, I'm res uh, primarily responsible for our home water efficiency programme, where we complete 22,000 visits per year, um, engaging with our customers on water efficiency. Um, these visits are made up of in-home visits and virtual 
um, engagement as well on various different platforms to try and reach um, different sets of customers. Um, we talk to them about um, their usage, um, what their water habits are, um, and educate them on how they can save water, energy, and money. Um, our team also installs water saving products such as water efficient shower heads, uh, tap aerators, saver flush bags, and so on. There's various other pro um, products that we install. Our key driver on this is obviously PCC, which is per capita consumption, uh, per capita consumption which is one of our top business commitments. Um, and we need to engage and work with our customers to sustain this precious resource. Um, so in terms of where we are, you know, I, th I think the market is, is fairly set up for it. Obviously, there's, there's set products that are out there. Obviously, um, you know, there are behavior change kind of pieces that we, we engage on customers with. But I think in terms of where we are as a business, um, we see water efficiency as a journey that we've made some really good progress in. However, we need to do more. Um, Affinity Water has invested heavily, not only in CapEx, but also in resource mm -hmm. to make headway in this space. Um, we currently have 29 projects that we run across the five pillars um, within our program to, fo uh, to focus on different aspects. So we run projects working with uh, social housing partners. Uh, we're looking at smartening our meters. Uh, we've recently redesigned our bill to make it clearer for our customers to understand what their usage is and so that they can really read that as well. And it's not just numbers all over a page. Uh, we've recently done a company rebrand as well because we want our customers to know who we are. Um, we've also been working with some developers on new developments, um, you know, for, for new build homes or retrofit schemes as well. Um, the customer behavior is uh, not something that, that we can change overnight and it's something that we have been working on. We've continued to work on um, to review, progress and adapt our activities to ensure that we're in the best place that we can be um, to, you know, to help our customers um, and, and drive down water usage. Um, I think that's kind of my perspective on that for there, Jim. Excellent. Thanks. So, yeah, very nice openness. So demand management per capita consumption, PCC range of operational responsibilities and just that f early figure of uh, home visits 22,000 just gives you a taste of course of the scale of the uh, the challenge facing us um, up and down the country so coming now to you Victoria as a knowledge leader pioneering research between a utility and a university your opening insights please so yeah I'm Vicky Danino I work for Anglian Water um, also a very customer focused uh, water company uh, in the region. Um, so we have, we have, uh, we're the lar largest uh, water company in England um, by area. Um, and that means we have quite a dispersed um, and distributed customer base. Um, where I come from, I had the Anglian Centre for Water Studies. So this is a research led um, organisation that um, focuses on water society and environment so we're very much looking at that societal and environmental aspects um, rather than um, some of the hard engineering um, options about how we manage um, uh, our water resources um, i work with a number of universities uh, and in this space uh, the university of east anglia um, manchester and cardiff are the people that i'm working most closely with around how do we change um, behaviors um, around water consumption as has already said, changing behaviours is really hard. Um, we do a lot within the sector about education. We do a lot about um, going to customers' homes and we do a lot about fitting devices. But how the customers use those devices is actually what's key. Um, if people are not actually using the devices in the way they're designed, if they're not engaging with those devices, if they don't like them, if they don't um, want them on display in the houses, I think there's a lot in energy sector about energy metering and um, about some of the things that um, happened with energy metering about you know those in-home devices. Uh, it's it's really complicated about how people engage with technologies as well as their attitudes and aspirations around water management. Um, and I, so there's a lot to go at and uh, through this conversation, um, I hope we'll start to really dig into what is actually a really complex uh, set of uh, things that we need to address. Excellent, thanks Vitti. So research and education, water society and environment and a nice point about sort of tech preferences and acceptance if you like. So bring us now to Emir, so a homes and technical excellence view from you please, from the government's housing accelerator, Emir. Thanks, Jim. Yes, yeah, so I'm Emir. I work in um, in what's called the Centre of Technical Excellence, and we're sort of like an intelligent client internally to Homes England, which is an exec agency of government. 
Um, we're self-funded, we're part of the development team. And so, you know, we, we take on sites at low value and put infrastructure in and, and, and effectively sort of sell it onto the market. So there's, sort of, I guess, several strands to our business. Um, we also grant fund the uh, affordable homes providers, you know, the sort of what we're housing associations. Um, so there's that angle as well. Um, but I think, you know, we've been um, uh, through a period of sort of deregulation in this space, really. Um, and we're moving now back into much more uh, much more regulation. And our, our predecessor organisations used to be quite prescriptive. So we had um, things like the Code for Sustainable Homes, which obviously has water efficiency as, as part, part component of it. Um, more recently, we've been working on new regulation, which is the emerging sort of future home standard. Um, that's majoring more on energy at the moment than water efficiency, but I suspect that will come in in terms of specification in time because it's a, an issue that uh, is very topical. Um, but from our point of view, it's not just sort of you know the, the water management within the building itself. I mean, I've worked with Bayes, the government department on on energy and renewable renewable energy and heat in particular. Um, so we use water as a medium then for district heat so, and so on. So you know, there's huge volumes of water in communal infrastructure as well as within the household itself. And also, I think, you know, a point uh, about just uh, the management of water as well. So surface water management, uh, green roofs, runoff, you know, uh, managing stormwater and, and flooding and so on. You know, these are all issues that are critical to us as, to, as part of climate change adaptation as well, as well as, you know, the reuse and management of water on site. So whether it can be used as grey grey water recycling and so on. So that, that is our master developer role and, you know, that we have we have all those sort of functions. Excellent. You're uh, you're not sure there's something to do there, Emir. No, <laughs> so from no. infrastructure and development, uh, water management through to affordable, sustainable homes. Nice point about perhaps a period of re-regulation, if you like, or post-deregulation, however you want to describe it. And of course, the uh, much talked about at the moment, future home standard. So uh, <clears throat> nice to have you join us today. And now coming to you, Neil, as a uh, marketing and customer-oriented thinker at the UK's leading shower manufacturer. So what? Where do you see things at the moment? Give us your perspective, please. Yes, Senior Marketing Manager at Triumph Showers. Um, um, basically, touch points on market, Marcom's uh, brand management work with both retail and trade channels, both customers B2B, B2C. Um, we're focusing actively engaging on all of our customers on our sustainable journey, where with British manufacturing, we feel we can add value to the process. Um, we set out some our sustainable targets at the start of 2020. Uh, we also went for a rebrand because we felt that we need to refocus um, where we were both culturally as as in addition to actually creating products to market and what our processes and our supply chains were. So we completely um, re-evaluated what our brand stands for and how we how we view culturally. Um, we were on a journey to be carbon neutral uh, by June this year, which we're, which we're on course to do. Um, carbon net zero by 2025. Uh, and we have partnered with the Carbon Trust to help us achieve this. Um, and in, we feel it enables us, as, as, as we evolve uh, on our sustainable journey, we will become more credible to our conversations like this and, and network with, um, with the, uh, the panellists and have meaningful conversations around uh, conserving water and saving energy because we believe, as the UK's leading share brand, we feel we have a pivotal role to play. Um, Trike manufacturers, um, electric showers, eco shower, mixer showers, and supplies into all of those um, typical developments that have been mentioned um, in regards to social housing, private developments and so on. And so we're, we're, again, we are looking at how we can, you know, look at customer behavior, how we can change behaviors, how we can have impact on the likes of the um, future home standards and what, what the future looks like as, as, as we're contributing. Um, eating water using electricity has long been an efficient method. Uh, in the home and our expertise in this area means that we are well placed to support the market. Uh, using electricity is still very much the future of showering and uh, there's never been a more critical moment really than right now to help users improve their consumption. Um, we believe we're, re uh, we're uniquely positioned to raise awareness at all those levels from industry to consumers about the benefits of high performance energy efficient shower solutions and the difference a product choice can make to water consumption and energy usage so we feel we can, as, as we um as we explore our, our sustainable journey we feel we're going to be in that innovative process as the market evolves as well excellent thank you neil so retail and trade leading manufacturer obviously social housing and private homes good to hear about the sustainable targets carbon neutrality 
also interesting to hear a little bit about cultural repositioning or rethinking, if you like, as part of that journey. So interesting to hear. We do have a little buzzing, I think, if other people are picking it up, but maybe we'll be able to isolate that as we go along. And, um, and appropriately enough, we're now moving into um, the middle section, which I call challenges and conflicts, which are the clues, the clues there in the name. So as we zoom in on specifics, I'd like to start challenging our panel as to why our water and energy consumption in the bathroom especially remains stubbornly resistant to change. Why those footprints are so hard to shrink. So what's the problem? Is it innovation, scale, cost, culture, habit, market forces, all of the above? What needs to happen to start mainstreaming water efficiency in the home? So we're getting to the difficult middle section. So your first stop, Emir. If I were to say to you, Obviously, there are many pressures on the homes market and government policy, floodplain planning, low EPC ratings, cladding fixes and more, all of the above. So let's cut to the chase. Will water use not just get lost in the mix, sidelined in the scramble to solve the housing crisis and the stampede towards net zero? Will water not just get lost in the mix, Emir? Well, I think you know, there's always a danger of that, isn't there? But I think, you know, with uh, climate change, uh, we're seeing effects immediately, aren't we, really? And particularly things like uh, flooding uh, is a big issue for uh, many of our sites, you know, and uh, flood management. And obviously we work with the Environment Agency on, uh, you know, kind of uh, taking account of that. So, mm -hmm. you know, taking on water and communal gardens and all the rest of it. But it, it, even those calculations that were done sort of 10 years ago are sort of, you know, sometimes not suitable now for, for the, for the yeah. new demand. So I think there's a there's a kind of adaptation side to it, um, but also just, um, you know, bits of the southeast, bits of Essex, et cetera, so you've got drought, drought issues potentially mm -hmm. in the summer now. So kind of, you know, water management increasingly important on site. And, you know, this is not just about um, fixtures and fittings, obviously showers and things like that have a have a, 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 pri a prime role. And when we were very prescriptive on the code, as I say, litreage per day, and those, those are the sort of things we were looking at, you know, low water use uh, fittings. Uh, but you can also manage, obviously, things like runoff and capture things like water for the garden from, uh, you know, um, tubs and so on that run, run off from, uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, drains. So I think, uh, you know, there's, there's, that's about, that is about specification. It is about product. So I think, you know, those, those are, um, issues that need to be enshrined in perhaps planning or, you know, kind of, a, <clears throat> or in uh, technical codes, regulation, building building codes. And I think, you know, you're seeing the government responding quite strongly probably on that now post COP26, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah, the future home standards forms part of that. Excellent. Thanks. Nice. Nice, nice response there from drought and flooding to kind of specification and product. It's all part of this adaptation piece, if you like. And Arguably, for the wrong reasons, we're more likely to see uh, water making headlines in the near future, increasingly and therefore rising up the public agenda and uh, foregrounding in the consciousness, if you like. So, Viti, my, my challenge to you. So, the role of the centre there is to build bridges between industry and academia to their mutual benefit and that of the wider water world. But if resource efficiency basically starts with consumers consuming less. How can high-level town and gown collaborations such as yours actually make a difference to that water use of that? Yeah, so ultimately we do need to consume less. And um, as apologies, the buzzing might be me. Um, so <laughs> in which case, I'll, I'll keep turning off my uh, my microphone, which probably means at some point someone's going to have to tell me I'm on mute. Um, so, um, but yeah, we need to consume less. I mean, I'm. Well, if we think back about how water, our water use in the home has changed maybe since, the, well, those of us who are old enough to remember, the 1970s and 1980s. You know, in my house when I was growing up, we had one bathroom. I now have three toilets in my house. There's two people living in my house. We had um, we had a one bath a week because actually it was quite difficult um, to have a bath and we, you know, washed in other ways that she used less water during the week. I would share a bath with my sister when I was really young. All of those attitudes to hygiene and cleanliness that have changed so much in our culture in the last 30 or 40 years are having a big impact on how we use water in our homes um, and particularly in the bathroom. So some of the, and I've used that example to, as an example of where the academic work can really help us change our thinking about what we are doing um, in our homes. So there's a piece of work by Ali Brown, who does a lot of work into our aspects of cleanliness and hygiene. So she's at the University of Manchester and actually beginning to look at what are some of those more systemic reasons that we use water differently than we did in the 1970s and probably the 80s. 
Um, and what is it about our environment? What are the products that we're using in our in our homes? What are the shampoos like? What are the soaps like? Mm -hmm. Do they need to use more water, less water? Why do we spend so long in the shower? Is that because our showers are really nice, which they weren't when I was using a shower, which had like, you know, that, that um, the, the rubber things that attached to two taps um, in your <laughs> bath and had a hose, you know, really you did not spend a long time showering when you had that kind of setup mm -hmm. in your house. So actually the configurations of technologies on our homes are encouraging us to use more water because it's easier, it's more pleasurable, it's, um, yeah, it's less of a problem. But also what's our expectation of, um, of each other and what we think we um, our, others expect of our hygiene um, when we go into offices. You know, I, I suspect there's lots of anecdotal evidences in there over lockdown about um, how often people are uh, re-wearing the same thing um, yeah. every day. Um, and and yet, you know, and when I went into the office, I kind of felt that I had to to change my top every day or you know um or even if it if it wasn't needed and then it would all get washed at the end of the week so again ali brown and claire Hulhan at manchester uh call um the floor drobe or the chair drobe you know those those clothes which you've worn <laughs> once and they aren't really dirty but they're probably you don't want to put back in the wardrobe um and they probably are in my house <laughs> they sit <laughs> in my in my floor drobe um until we kind of do washing of stuff that's really dirty and they think well actually i'll i'll wash all of that even though it's not actually really dirty so all of those kind of aspects of how we treat our clothes um you know what we buy um what's necessary about maybe the fabrics that we use that that change um how we dress um so some of the academic work that maybe reframes our thinking and reframes our attitudes to what the problem actually is um rather than um the uh the symptoms that we look to address um so that's kind of an example of where we've used that. Um, another example is particularly around the behavioural change piece where we've taken the best um, behavioural science and embedded it in the company. So there's a scheme called Knowledge Transfer Partnerships, um, which is funded by Innovate UK. And what that does is give us a person to work in the company to embed academic research into the company so we can use it in our own context. And what we've done with that is taken the psychology approaches, so the nudge approaches and um, social norms approaches um, that, are, that are out there. And we've created a behavioural change toolkit within the business. And we can now use that toolkit for a lot of the different behavioural change things that, that we do as businesses. And that's not just water efficiency. That's about health and safety. It's about bad debt. It's about um, um, how, you know, how people are working in offices and all of those things that we might want to change about sustainable transport and how people are getting into offices. That's all around behavioural change. So by taking that academic research and embedding it in the business, it enables us to take that wider view about how we do things and do it in the best way possible. So the first piece of that work was to do a review of the behavioural change around water efficiency, mainly um, that happened in the last um, asset management planning cycle. And we, we looked at what we could find and found that the vast majority of what we did was education. We went and told people what they should do. We went and told them what the, the issue is. Um, and we, we might have given them some of the resources to do that. Um, but we didn't use all the other kind of levers that you have around behavioural change that are out there in behavioural sciences. Most of those were not used. And the other big thing was we didn't evaluate the effectiveness of them. So we might have evaluated the reach, how many people have we reached, how many emails have we sent out, who's responded to our Twitter feeds, all of that. But we didn't manage mm -hmm. to actually say what the behavioural change was as a result. And that can be really difficult, but that's where technologies like smart metering really come into their own. That enables us to really see what does work and what doesn't and how we use that data is vitally important about how we continue to engage customers with their water consumption, um, not only when their meter is fitted, but long term. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Very nice response. So uh, academic research helping to identify the cause rather than just perhaps the symptoms that we're more conscious of. Nice point about hygiene and cleanliness, putting pressure on resource use, if you like. And we've obviously seen a lot post COVID in terms of air quality expectations and hand washing in offices and all sorts of um, new developments in that respect. Even through to, as you mentioned, shampoos and soaps. And I think the idea of 
the user experience the ux in this you know it's it's very easy to talk about the technical and trade side of things but you know these are people and humans and it's a user experience and it can be very pleasurable such as showering etc and a, a nice name check also i hasten to add for the floor drobe and chair drobe which is is probably the kind of phrase i'm i'm likely to recycle in the nicest possible way now i was going to come to neil however i think uh, temporarily he is maybe reconnecting so I might switch the order of things and uh, hop to you here, Steve, first and say, so we know Affinity, we know the Save Our Streams campaign you've been running there over, I think, 170,000 signups before the end of last year. Um, but it was launched in response to data that showed that your customers actually consume 9% more water per day than the national average. So my challenge to you, Steve, is how do you hope to break what effectively sound like pretty hardwired bad habits? Yeah, so thanks for that, Jim. So, you know, I think it's fair to say that PCC has historically been a challenging target for the company. Mm -hmm. We have identified that. And obviously, as we said, we've, we've invested heavily in, you know, resourcing CapEx to, you know, to, to really address that. So if I sort of start, you know, water companies are managing five-year cycles that we call AMPs, so asset management periods. And in the current five-year business plan, uh, so from 2020 to 2025, which we call AMP7, we were given the biggest reduction target for household consumption, which is a 12.5% 12 uh, 12 PCC reduction, um, mm -hmm. which is which is huge, which is, you know, yeah. very, very difficult. Um, obviously, on top of that, sort of the area that we operate in is is is, is a difficult area to, to work in within the southeast. Um, obviously, the, envir the environmental agency has already classified it as a water scarce, a water scarce region. Mm -hmm. Um, just to add to our challenges um, and you know with, within our region we've got some areas that you know have a good PCC and we have some that have very high PCC um, and we are currently addressing that and currently targeting that to reduce consumption you know what kind of the panel have touched on and what I touched on earlier is that you know all customers are different um, and we have to you know we can't have a one-size-fits-all approach to, to everyone so as part of our home visits we, we speak to you know to, to customers differently um, than to the to the previous job that we've just done for instance um obviously on, on top of that um you know we've we had covid which is which has caused um you know a more initiative more, more of an issue if you like um you know we had household increase household in, um consumption increased again um due to businesses being closed and we found that sort of to be within our central region which is along the west of the m25 corridor um, where people weren't commuting into London due to businesses being closed. We found water habits at home had changed because people were using swimming pools at home. They weren't going on holiday or they weren't going to the seaside. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, you know, we had the weather impacts as well, where we had a really sort of early hot spring, um, which, which, which changed people's um, habits at home. So kind of what we've done to, to counteract that as well. So, you know, we didn't stop there and, and say, right, we can't do anything. There's nothing out of our control. So, you know, in part of our home water efficiency program, we moved it to a complete virtual service so we can still engage with our customers, help our customers to, you know, try and reduce their consumption and also reduce their bills as well at a time that was quite a difficult period for, for, for many. Um, and we're, we're always looking for, for new and innovative technologies. Um, and we're also, you know, trying to trial um, new projects as well. Um, so when we did sort of open up again, we've got an area within Clacton, uh, which is fairly water stressed. And we find that when people do holiday there, the population increases, therefore production increases. And obviously we, we don't want to have to produce more water again. That has a huge environmental impact, but also it, it, it makes it difficult for us to manage um, demand within the network. Um, so we've done something different where we worked with uh, with our retailers and worked with some non-household um, holiday parks. Um, and we, we came to them and said, look, we, we want to help you reduce your consumption. You know, off the back of COVID, people are going to be coming on holiday again to the region. Um, and, and, you know, they were very happy for our help. So we, we carried out a kind of a trial across four sites within the area. Um, and we installed some innovative technology. We had some smart meters set up on site. We installed some some flow regulators, sort of shower heads, things like that across the site. And we've achieved the 45% reduction across four of the sites within the region. So millions and millions of water, of, of litres of water that's saved there. But what's that, what's that showing us is that, you know, we can do things in a different way. So not just effectively PCC, which is in home reduction, but we can also reduce, reduce the demand side of things. 
Um, so we are now looking at, you know, that non-household aspect as well within um, some of our projects and our activities and also engaging with, you know, retailers to put not pressure, but to, to work closely with with their clients as well um, for to, to, to bring that kind of reduction across the network. Um, on top of that, obviously, we across our projects we're doing a lots of engage engagement in behavioral changes we've, we've, we've worked with you know the behavioral insights team to, to to get the kind of best in the business if we can behavioral um, change techniques um but, you know we can undertake all of these activities but you know the only way to, to to ensure sustainability on this is that you know our customers work with us on this um to, to bring us in line with the industry average so you know th there's lots of work we're doing in this space Jim, I can just quickly move to, to kind of to save our streams, um, Jim, that you touched on before. So we, we set up um, this campaign in line with our environmental kind of outcome as, as, as our business. Um, so SOS stands for save our streams, um, which by that we mean our rare precious chalk streams. So if customers can reduce their water waste and activities, we can reduce the amount we extract from chalk streams to meet customer demand. And our, our customer engagement teams have um feedback that, that's, that this really resonates with our customers who are keen to support uh, our sustainable uh, sustainability ambitions um so we we uh, monitor and model the campaign benefits to ensure that we're seeing the intended impact um kind of in the long term not only just in the short term so we can ensure that you know that's sustainable um and just some 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 numbers for you really which is quite exciting on this campaign um that we've we've had a reach of over 34 million people We've had in excess of 179,000 signups, right. um, but key to ensuring the, the long term behavior change um, in the water efficient community that we've established and built is that we continue to engage with people on signups and then we give them incentives as well. So we'd be doing prize draws, challenges to complete on the on, on the platform. Um, we, we're doing um, ongoing education, um, which we feel is key to break the cycle of bad habits. Um, and we're, we're looking at, you know, more kind of education projects where we, you know, teaching children on water saving behaviours. And we're actually looking um, and, and setting up a, um, a kind of a Minecraft platform as well, which is fairly oh, new. Okay, cool. That would resonate with um, with children more so. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of kind of where we are on that. But I think just sort of touching on sort of bathroom, what you was mentioning with the other panellists earlier is what we tend to, to find as well from from our in-home visits is that um, the bathroom is quite a, a personal place where I think you know any family member of a busy household will go to to get away from everyone else. So, um, you know, having that nice shower or having that nice long bath is something that people don't really want to give up. But you can educate them on maybe not flushing the toilet after a number one. Yeah many times etc <laughs> so um we um you know we, we've tried to say to our customers look you know if you do have a shower but you know if you could reduce the time maybe a little bit you know i've been in homes with customers and they say oh my daughter's been in the shower for an hour and you know i have to kind of hide my face because it's, it's, it's an excessive time but um again it's all in the education piece um and again with people having baths we say look we don't want you to not have a bath but could you you know not maybe have so many and replace it with a shorter shower etc so yeah um there's as i said there's lots going on in this space you know we, we 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 understand and we know that there's more that we need to do as a business for for pcc and we've got some really tough targets but kind of what i touched on earlier in terms of the amount of projects we're doing and the investments that we've made we're confident um, and we've seen some really good benefit already in what we're doing, and we just need to to keep pushing forward with that. Excellent, thanks, Steve. So, beyond PCCs, you mentioned water scarcity. Also, of course, a reminder that all customers are different. There isn't a one size fits all approach. Um, interesting to hear you talk about. You know, I mean, with COVID, especially, there have been fluctuating and atypical demand patterns that historically we haven't seen, perhaps. And balancing ideas of resilience and agility, obviously, as a business, has been very challenging. And uh, good to hear you mention in connection with uh, your SOS. I think chalk streams, if I'm right in thinking, isn't Fergal Sharkey um, a celebrity champion of chalk streams? Am I right? I don't know. As an old weekend punk and the undertones, that seems to uh, spring to mind. But there we are. Neil, we can't see you, but I don't know. Can you hear us and can we hear you? Uh, yeah, I'm here. I can definitely Great. see you guys. Can you hear me? Great. Well, we can hear you. So can I? Can we just do audio only then, Neil? Because I was going to ask you in this challenging section, quick one to finish with. So launched by Triton of an 
online water and energy savings calculator. It helps raise awareness of consumption in electric or mixer showers, for sure, and the savings that could benefit the planet and the bill payers' bank balance. Well, my challenge to you is, is it enough just to provide those customers with the info and then trust them, fingers crossed, to make good and better choices? So is that enough, Neil? I think as Steve, uh, Steve rightly says, there's, the people see their, their bathroom as a haven. It's their sanctuary, isn't it? They, they kind of, uh, they're, they're probably likely to spend more time because they say trying to get away from something, trying to get away from the mad, mad rush of the kids in the morning. Um, just have a you know, spare, spare 10 minutes on their own kind of thing. And um, I think as, as, as the panel's mentioned, it's, it is about habitual use. It really is about you know, what products are out there, what options are out there for me to slightly change that, but I still have the same experience. I think Steve may have mentioned sharing in less or uh, less water in your bathroom, things like that. Uh, we surveyed 2,000 people across the UK about their Sharon water usage habits and found 86% of respondents claim reducing water waste is important to them, but 64% are actually unsure how to monitor the, uh, their own usage and how to how to plan that and what that looks like, what type of products are available. So I think it's very much, uh, as Steve mentioned, an educational piece and what the options are available to them. There's also a degree of myth busting in our survey. We found 54% of people think eco products are actually cost more, more expensive, yep. which, is not, which is not always the case. Um, I think there are probably assumptions based on different marketplaces. So you've got the car, the car marketplace at the moment where cars probably are more expensive, um, electric cars and hybrid cars. But we know the, of that, the, the evolution of that market will change that as, as, as it becomes a mass market product. Um, but it's not necessarily the case in other marketplaces. It, that there, is, there is products out there that are efficient and can help you uh, be sustainable or, or at least be part of sustainable. I think um, it's encouraging to see customers are willing to make changes that not only save money but also help the environment. So they feel they're doing their bit. And I think that's where the bigger context of the backdrop of water usage and certainly energy usage is everybody did their bit. There's a, that accumulation piece that we can all we can all help that process move forward and obviously help manufacturers and the market move forward from an innovation perspective. I think these results also reflect on a wider concern about how homes contribute to low impact society. Almost 80%, for example, said they expect house builders to now develop homes that are environmentally friendly. Mm -hmm. So again, there's a there's that it's not just about retrofit, it's about what, what does the future look like from a development perspective. I think to help both home, homeowners, developers, specifiers, and installers make informed choices, um, we, we've, we've developed an intuitive tool ourselves to show how much water energy use um, can be used by a typical electric or mixer shower in a res residential setting with our um, online um, water savings calculator and, and, and energy use calculator to help educate but partly help inform uh, con 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 conscious consumers and specifiers and sort of the wider marketplace. Um, in, in regards to specifying bathrooms, we can also equip um, provide wider data backdrops on projects. So, for example, we could take all the details from a, a, an individual project and we could plug them into the calculator and illustrate how, how savings can be made with boiler and shower combinations and so on. So it is very much uh, what options are out there and how best they can they be used, I think. Excellent. Thank you, Neil. And uh, yeah, some nice points. So bathroom as haven, sanctuary, or even escape room, even for the conscious consumer, Good statistics there. So 86% have good intentions. 64% don't really know how to realize those. We're talking about this mind the gap between the aspiration and the action, which is a very common challenge in terms of eco lifestyles or greening behaviors, shall we say. And a little good mention for the, the myth busting around the idea of a green premium, which in many cases doesn't actually apply. As you say, it's potentially a carryover from different sectors or even historical products and market kind of information. So um, I encourage the audience um, who are from far and wide, including Abdul and Hyderabad, uh, do pop your questions in the ask a question box should be at the bottom of your screen. We'll come to those just after this next round. We already have one from Laura. So we're, we're getting ready for that. So this final round, I'm going to because we're good for time just I'm going to ask you to virtually give me a minute panelists. This is the uh, having looked at the challenges, the problems. This is the 
reasons to be cheerful. This is what I call my positives and hopes section before we go to the Q&A. So we're going to look at how successful, sustainable approaches could really get us where we want in terms of water efficient technology, systems, behaviours, save energy, cut carbon. So first up, Neil, to get us where we want and need to go with water efficiency in about a minute, what's your one message the industry absolutely must get across to the consumer? That's your one message. What is it, Neil? Yeah, we think the industry needs to take, uh, needs to continue to bang the drum on sustainability measures and how consumers, when selecting and using products regarding water efficiency and energy energy saving, um, in particular, uh, great awareness is needed on the fact that opting for energy and water saving showers doesn't mean paying a higher price, as, as we've said. Now, electric showers are an efficient option as they heat water on demand. Um, for example, used in our report, uh, I think has just been posted in the feed. As an average family of four could save more than 48,000 litres of water per year by opting for an electric shower over a mixer. Um, that's just one example. Um, with electric showers set to play a key role in reducing domestic water and energy consumption, um, specifiers and developers are well positioned to take advantage of the latest technology and evolution of innovation. And by working closely together with manufacturers and choosing electric products for new build and refurb projects, there is much the um, industry can do to help make a huge difference today and in the future. I think it's in, in part it's the, the sum of its parts. It's we've all, we've all got a, we've all got an opportunity to make a difference. We all need to work together to to make that difference, and that's including the people using the products as well. Excellent, thank you. So it's a team game, banging the drum for uh, a complete holistic, collaborative approach to tackling this. So then, if I, I come now to you, Steve, your minute, final minute, some top tips. What simple water saving solutions? should become the norm in the home of tomorrow so fire out your top tips please Steve. yes yeah, so i think obviously kind of you know there is normal industry ones that we'll talk about so you know if you're brushing your teeth turn the tap off um you know have shorter showers um i think sort of what i touched on earlier in terms of we've been doing um trigger-based comms as well so obviously we, we we reach out to customers maybe a month before hot weather's coming in so if people are using swimming pools put a cover over it it'll prolong the the life of the water being used rather than people just emptying it and refilling it or maybe even using enough water to water your plants if you do need to refill it um i think a, a key message from from me really as well and is, is that you know we we need to continue to engage our customers and we want our customers to know that we are here to help as well so if if customers are financial trouble or struggling or they do have a leak and they don't know how to get it resolved is to come to us and discuss that and um, we you know we are here to help we've got different sets of teams and people within the business that can help you know we do have um but we help vulnerable customers we have priority services registers teams as well so we are here to help on that but yeah i think the message is is um save water where you can um if you only have one cup of tea you don't fill the kettle all the way up use the eco setting on the dishwasher if you do have one um and um you know we we can we can continue to do all this work that we're doing, but if 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 customers don't want to listen or customers don't want to take action themselves, then it's going to make it really really difficult. Excellent. So, nice points there. We have obviously covered some of the big challenges that are maybe costly and difficult and slow, but as you've illustrated there, there are loads of quick wins, easy to do, low hanging fruit, simple solutions. None of it's rocket science in terms of what you're describing there. Virtually, you know, these are very doable right now, today, tomorrow, etc. So, Emir, if I come to you for your last minute, so rather than being part of the problem, how can water use become part of the solution? For sustainable homes in the future so uh sell us sure. your vision of how water is going to be uh, yeah i think solution. neil and uh steve have covered a lot of the kind of detail around you know kind of what the within the home and i think you know that is a fundamental part part of it but obviously uh for us we have a, a place making role you know and i think um uh the pandemic's laid bare some of that isn't it you know our green spaces and things like that have become much more important to us probably you know overlooked yep. spaces in development and they, they should be multifunctional, really, shouldn't they? So they should, you know, have a function in terms of water management, runoff, flood management, uh, possibly, you know, water recycling, as well as being nice places to, to be or for children to play and so on. So um, I think that's, that's you know, uh, every development, every space, I think we need to think in, the, in, those, in, those, in those, those terms. Excellent. So thinking green and blue and design, uh, designing for water in, in the broadest sense, because obviously, um, we are designing for a long term future. And if we're beginning already, as like Steve mentioned, you know, water scarcity and stress, we're already seeing the warning signs. 
you know, in 2022 and we're designing for 2030 potentially onwards. So, um, yes, it's, it's a planning thing. So um, if I come now, uh, finally, um, Vittoria, Vitti, if some future gazing. So just give us a final minute. Fast forward five or ten years, how different might the world of water look by then? Do you want the optimistic or the pessimistic? Well, this is really just to be cheerful. So, so give us, give us your so happy thoughts. To be cheerful. So, <laughs> I think in five or ten years, we um, we will have a generation of people who are now who are not currently our customers, who are our, who will be our customers, who um, have a broader view of sustainability, um, and who are bringing that through. So, you know, so the people who are currently at school become our customers. And in five or 10 years, they are the people who will be paying their bills and they are the people who will be making decisions about the fittings in their homes, the types of homes that they buy and how they want to use their water. And I think as that generation and the ones that come after them um, grow up, we'll see a very sh slow shift. The pessimist in me goes, yeah. that's not quick enough. And therefore we need to start thinking in a radically different way. We've been talking about shorter showers, turn off the tap, um, don't water your garden, uh, you know, don't use a pressure hose for years, probably decades, and we are still talking about it. And to me, that says it doesn't work, or it's not working, or we haven't made it work. And therefore we need to take a really radical and different approach. And I'm not saying I know what that is, um, but I think we need to really pivot that and be looking um, in a, in a more holistic way, in a completely different way. Um, and uh, I'm using the work that's coming out of universities to help us frame that. There is a little bit of me, and I'm, she says, um, don't quote me on this. There's a little bit of me that thinks we need to have a massive drought with standpipes in the ground. People who remember the big droughts in 1970, whatever, I don't, I am too young for that, still talk about that drought. They still remember those actions. People now have never known that. From their perspective, there is enough water. We live in a wet country, it's always raining. So without those kind of key trigger points, and to be honest, until I think I think until people try and turn on the tap and water doesn't come out of it, they will not recognize the value of water or that we are in a water stressed area. We will never allow that to happen as water companies. And it will I strongly believe that. But we need something that is going to make people realise it's not always raining, especially not in the east of England. Uh, thank you, and uh, and uh, I agree with you. In spite of the fact I'm from Lancashire, where it rains quite a lot, to be honest. <laughs> uh, that's a no, nice. No, that's a very good point. Generational shift is happening, but as generational implies, it's slow, and time is not on our side. We know it's already later than we think. This is urgent for sure. So, on that note, being time not exactly being on our side, we do have about ten minutes, and we already have a few questions fired in. So, do type them in the bottom. I'm going to shoot them out at um, my panelists here and if we're going to try and take these in pretty quick fire the first one i'm going to take is actually in the chat not in the ask a question uh, and i'm going to give that to you steve i think because it's on pcc targets if you want to give me so dave goh from uh, artesia consulting does the panel so steve first off think if pcc targets are not met there'll be a requirement for financial controls such as variable tariffs to help manage demand water's too cheap so what thoughts on that, Steve? If you give us a quick fire response. Yeah, good, good, good question, Dave. If I'm honest, I, I don't know the answer to that question, um, so I, I couldn't, I couldn't answer it, unfortunately. Um, but obviously, this, Dave's last piece there is water too cheap. Obviously, my personal opinion, and obviously the job that I do on a on a daily basis, I I, I think it is very cheap for for what we get. Obviously, anyone involved in the water industry will understand the process it goes through to come out of our mm -hmm. tap yep. absolutely clean and perfect to use. So personally, I do think it is too cheap. And I think, you know, um, the price that people pay for it, I think, it, it, you know, we, the people, it does get wasted because we just feel that, as, as Vitti said earlier, we feel it's always going to be there and it's such a, ch a cheap source. Um, you know, it, it, it gets wasted. Whereas, you know, four pounds for a coffee, if you spill a drop, you go mad about it. So, yeah, I think in, in my personal opinion, it is too cheap. Um, but in terms of if targets are missed, um, I, I, I don't know if, if that's the route that, that companies would go down. Excellent. Good point. And taking up some of these, all, they're all related points, I might add. So nice question from Laura Taylor, also in the chat. She's asking for advice on targeting homes that may suffer fuel slash water poverty. How do we engage these people water efficiency messages cut through the noise and priorities? If I could throw that to you, Neil, because that's a nice different take on it, really. Well, not different, but um, 
uh, a reality check in terms of water poverty. So um, how are you finding the uh, communication and messaging around those for whom it's, it's a serious, costly um, consideration? I think the challenge, I think the challenge from, as, as a manufacturer it, to engage consumers is, um, is, is the biggest challenge we've had, we've had to make, I think, in, in the sense of how do, we, how do we gain exposure of the problem to, to the end users. And I think that's where working with the likes of the water companies and energy, energy companies comes in. Um, you know, 50% of our business is through trade, so through development, and the, the other 50 is through retail. So it's, it's either working with the retailers or working with the, the, the trades, the trade side, whether it's with the merchants, contractors, or the actual decision makers. So it's quite a complex, there's no real one way to answer. It's quite a complex question to it. Uh, there's, there's, there's several different answers you could give depending on the route, I think. Um, I think, as, as, I think as, as Vitti mentioned, you know, you know there's, we've tried this scenario s- several times in regards to, you know, this is a virtual use, how can we change it? And um, I don't think one business, certainly one, one shower company can do that. Uh, it will take the industry uh, to do that, I think. Yeah, excellent. Actually, Vitti, nice to bring you in there because I'm going to give you about two, if not three, of the questions all in one go. So um, so picking up on the water poverty question, then in the questions box, we also have um, from Samantha Mant saying, putting those poverty section aside for a moment, um, is the low price for water a key problem? And um, we also have the question of if it's hard to get the simpler message of water conservation across, does the panel think it's possible to raise a significant issue of saving energy through water management treatment, or is that too hard? So if I could bundle those all together, Bitty, and sort of say, so water poverty, cheap water, how do we get it across um, with or without mentioning the pounds and pence aspect? So I think the first thing is, who is we? You know, actually, people might look at water companies and those in the industry and go, well, why are you asking us to use less of your product? That makes no sense to me. So actually, who are the other trusted voices that are around us that people do engage with? Who, you know, how are they people engaging with water already? They will be engaging with water in lots of different ways. You know, the way you engage with water comes out of the tap is different to the way you engage with that chalk stream down the river, down the road. And I have got a chalk stream down my my road. So actually, that kind of environmental water consumption uh, question is it's something that I think we need to have a good go at. When we do that, we need to be very careful about what other messaging is going around it. People who might be motivated by environmental motivators might not want to have a price thing because then it becomes dirty. I'm being paid for something that I should be doing, and that makes me feel like I'm not doing it for the right reasons. So we need to be careful around those types of things. And that kind of also links with the water poverty question. We as um, an industry and the energy sector and people like uh, the, um, the CAB, um, they we, we need to be working together. Why why does a consumer have to go to their energy company and their water company and somebody else mm-hmm. to talk about water poverty? And I know there's a whole GDPR yeah. minefield in yeah, that, definitely. but um, how can we help customers do that um, without them actually having to know who all of those different organizations are? At least with your water company, you don't have a huge amount of choice, you know, <laughs> but um, some people might not know who they, who they buy their energy from. So where, where do you go um, around that? Um, pricing. Um, yes, at the moment, low price of water means we don't can't use it as a lever for water. Mm-hmm. The water energy link, it's still so small, we probably can't use it as a lever. Um, and, you know, if you look at high users, the people who have swimming pools, um, they, you know, the price will need to go up so high for them to care, we won't be able to do it. The, and and also things like tariffs we did a piece of work around tariffs a few years ago and you have to be so careful you can get a huge number of unintended consequences Mm -hmm. when you do tariffs there was a piece of work i think in colorado where they played with tariffs and water consumption went up because they got it wrong and so um you really we need to be careful around tariffs generally um what was the other question (laughs) i think you've covered them all actually (laughs) You've done sterling work there, so well, well done, Vitti. And we're into the last uh, four or so minutes, and so the uh, uh, the last question I think in the box or the bottom one I think uh, I'd like to throw to you, Emir, because uh, it's Kerry Stranix from Groundwork, an environmental charity familiar to all of us, I'm sure. Um, how important do you think it is that we support water customers to make the link? between water scarcity slash use and climate change. And I'd like also to add to that, if it, if, as if it's not a big enough question already, Emir, but also what lessons perhaps can we learn from the energy story 
in that space. So um, if you'd like to answer, so um, uh, yeah, Kerry's questions there, how important is it to link it to the bigger climate change agenda and can we learn from the energy story? Emia. Yeah, Good I think question. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, we, and we're sort of one step removed from the consumer, actually. So we don't do an awful lot on the consumer side, but um, we do work with organizations uh, like Energy Systems Catapult, which you may mm. have come across, which is a sort of spin off from Bayes and does a lot of work on, on smart metering and, and consumer interface and all the rest of it. I think it's very important. I mean, um, one issue that's coming through for us as part of a future homes standard, because we're doing trials on some of our sites, is that the worry that there'll be higher electricity demand actually. So therefore, you know, from heat pumps mm -hmm. and therefore um, for for poorer consumers, uh, you know, it could, it could actually impact them quite a lot, uh, which, you know, is not helpful in terms of, uh, you know, say we're moving towards a sustainable future, but actually, you know, there may be additional costs. So um, there's a lot about how, uh, you know, how people understand and use, use this technology uh, within the home uh, and how, how it's, you know, how, how, what's best, what the, I mean, heat pumps operate, for instance, in a very different way. So you can, I mean, you're better having them on long and low rather than the usual, what we're used to, which is putting the gas on, you know, morning and evening and having it on very high. So there's, there's things like that, which need to be, I think, translated across to the consumer side. And then from the point of view of placemaking, things like that, suds and things like that, I think, you know, there's, there's a natural education that happens. People can see, I think, that uh, multifunctional spaces, you know, the kids play in them and, it's, and so on. But things like interpretation boards and things like that, I think, are an important part of, uh, you know, within development of, of educating people about what, why things look a particular way uh, and how they operate. Excellent, thanks. Yeah, and um, when we're sort of bang on time there, so Neil, if I could just come to you for a final word, just picking up what some of Emir said. Then, obviously, we're talking about energy and water, and literally, your savings calculator has both those words in its name. How important is it to you at Triton to not only relate those, but also just put it in the context of this climate agenda? I know we don't want to get too big picture, but how important for consumers, the Blue Planet generation? Those who are worried watching the documentaries, how important is it to make those linkages in their understanding? Yeah, I think we're in a we're in a unique as a bit as trying as an electric shower com, shower company, but obviously shower manufacturers are. Um, we're in a unique position in regards to electric showers, as as Emily mentioned. Um, you know, something like a gas heated water is obviously going to be a lot more expensive than electric instantaneous heated heated water. In, in the sense of the energy uh, side of things, from a cost perspective, electric showers. Are naturally are naturally more efficient and would be low, low cost as well at the same time and we go to the the contextual water efficiency perspective that's, there's a there's a there's a huge opportunity for end users for manufacturers uh, and commercial uh, and from the commercial side as well to make quite a big difference in regards to what what the type of usage is within homes obviously the landscape of the boiler the boiler manufacturer at the moment is evolving and that will change the that will change the de developments going forward as well. So I think that I think it is changing. Um, and so I said I think I said in my previous point, it's going to take everybody to to manipulate and manufacture that change um, going forward. And, and as, as Vitti says, um, you know, there's some huge movements that need to be made for all these things to be put into place. It's not going to it's not going to happen overnight. We've been manufacturing showers for 40 plus years, and we're, we're in the space now of evolution of sustainability conversation where we need to make a different make a difference and we need to help consumers make a difference as well excellent nice point to close on and i think good uh, suggestion there the idea of flipping if you like from a risk to an opportunity mindset as well you know we do need to engage the entrepreneurial engine if we want to accelerate the change there is opportunity and there is dynamic positive change to be had to tackle the issue so perfect we are bang on time then so in closing thank you big thank you to the panelists Vitti Emir Stephen of course Neil and our sponsors at Triton to yourselves out there virtual audience and crowdcast for your comments and questions reminder to check out elemental elementalexpo.com as I said at the top of the show the online community for professionals focused on innovation heat water and energy the vital elements within the built environment now and in the future Find the full diary of events on the website, upcoming webinars, back catalogue. This will be available immediately after we close here so you can re-watch it. Go back on demand to catch the first bit. If you joined late, you can share it with colleagues and friends. So it'll all be available immediately following our finish here. So that's it for today. Thank you again to the panel. I've been Jim McClelland, editor at Susmeme. Thanks for watching and we'll see you all again soon. Thanks Save again. water. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.